Our reading is taken from Psalm 8, and it's to be found on page 546 in the blue, on the blue, in the blue Bible. This is a psalm of David. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So far the reading. Marja, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name's Ben Johnson. I'm one of the pastors together with Shady. And uh, my privilege to be able to take that passage, Psalm 8, uh, which was actually written about 3,000 years ago, and to help us understand it and to know what it might actually say to us now in the age uh, of 2023. And that's what we love to do as Christians. We love to take the Word of God, which we believe was actually written under the inspiration of God's Spirit, so that even though it's an ancient word and it has its historical context, uh, it still speaks to us very clearly about who God is and who we are and how we can be in relationship with Him. So I'm going to take a moment to pray towards that end, and then we'll uh, keep the Bible open there, Psalm 8. And there's another way you can get uh, the Bible, actually, is just go to your web browser and just put in Psalm 8 and search for that, and it can come up right before you on your device as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you're a God who's not veiled in mystery, uh, that the God who created the world, who indeed created us, has revealed Himself uh, thank you for the way that you did that before Jesus through uh, prophets of many kinds and the way you've done that in the writing of this psalm, this song, Psalm 8. But thank you most fully for the way you did that when your word actually took on flesh, came among us in the person of Jesus. And thank you that we can find our life in him. So it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, did you know that uh, the most powerful telescope that we have uh, situated within our atmosphere, the Hubble Telescope, recently recorded the rare event of a star being swallowed up by a black hole at the core of galaxy ES0583-G004. Now, if you think that's a strange name for a galaxy and you think, hang on, why didn't they just give it a name? Well, it's because there are around 100 to 200 billion galaxies in the universe. Now, here's one of them. This is the Milky Way. This is our galaxy. And there was a time when we thought that the Milky Way was the universe. But now we understand that there are 100 to 200 billion galaxies in the universe. Get your head around that. Now, this particular galaxy that the Hubble Telescope observed is nearly 300 million light years away. Uh, if you want to try to imagine how far that is, uh, then think of the, the speed of light. It travels around our equator at sea level six times in one second. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, 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 okay? And now, all you have to do is travel at that speed for 300 million years, and you'll reach galaxy ESO 583G. Zero, zero, 004. Well, of course, the Hubble telescope doesn't actually observe what happens that far away simply by using magnifying lenses, bringing images to the naked eye if you happen to be there or upon a screen if it was uh, um, telecommunicated down to Earth. 
Um, it actually sees what's going on in the deep recesses of space by using powerful ultraviolet sensitivity to study the light waves uh, that are coming from distant galaxies. So here's an artist's impression of what was recently observed. Uh, number one, top left, a normal star passes near a supermassive black hole in the centre of a galaxy. And then number two, on the top right, the star's outer, gal outer gal gases are pulled into the black hole's gravitational field. And so three, the star's actually shredded as these tidal forces, they call them, or gravitational forces, actually pull the star apart. And then the stellar remnants come into this donut shape around the black hole. They eventually fall into the black hole and then it unleashes a um, tremendous amount of light and high energy radiation. That's the fate of one star. Did you know that there are uh, more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand in all the beaches and all the deserts on our planet Earth? 3,000 years ago, when a shepherd by the name of David lay on his back in the field one night and looked out at the starry sky, he knew none of this, but he wrote Psalm 8 because he sensed something of the size of the creation that stretched out above him and he knew it was God's workmanship. He said, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens and when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers and the moon and the stars you've set in place. You know, the Bible is very clear that everything that we can see, whether it's the naked eye or the telescope or the microscope, everything that we can touch, smell, hear and taste, the physical things are in fact created things. They are the work of God's fingers, metaphorically, so to speak. He has set them in his, their place. And if these things, like the created things, like the starry skies and the rolling oceans and the mountain snow-capped mountain peaks and the dry desert plains, and, and then all the creatures and the plant life that inhabit them, if we marvel at them, how much more should we marvel and praise the Creator of all those things? The psalmist exclaims in breathless wonder, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Some people like to think that the scientific endeavour over the last few hundred years has destroyed any notion of there being a creator God because we now understand a lot more about our created world, what it is or how it works. And somehow that answers our questions about who caused it to be here or why it even exists. But science and faith in God actually ask different questions. We can study the depth and the complexity of this created world and it should lead us to praise and adoration of the Creator. How majestic is your name? But it also should lead us to a very humble recognition of ourself. And in verse 4, the psalmist turns his contemplative gaze out upon the heavens to himself. And he says, What is humankind? that you're mindful of them, human beings, that you care for them. Not surprising really, is it, that we're left with these questions as we look out upon that vast universe. We look out there and we think, that is so big, I can't even comprehend 300 million light years. What is our place here? What is our significance? Who are we? I mean, in the vast universe of practically emptiness, but for balls of burning gas and suspended dust. Is there any purpose for the most sophisticated life form that exists? Or are we just a remarkable and somewhat surprising suspension of atoms that somehow conduct electrical impulses and, and house metabolo metabolic st storehouses that convert uh, energy to life and, uh, and human consciousness? Maybe we're just lost in this universe. These are the big questions that we're left with. And it really seems that human beings are the only life form that actually asks these questions. I mean, think of dogs. They're pretty intelligent. I've got two of them, a blue healer and a red healer, quite intelligent cattle dogs. But this is about as complex as it gets for a dog. Uh, I'm a good boy. I, I know this because my master says so. And the master throws the st stick for a dog to fetch. But how does my master know? How does she know? Um, no, perhaps I only appear to be a good boy. 
Oh, what does it even mean to be truly a good boy? Oh, so many questions. Who's a good boy? I am. <laughs> there, that settles it. Settles it for a dog anyway. You get it, don't you? That's as complex as it gets for a dog. Who's a good boy? <laughs> I am. I am. I brought the stick back. I'm a good boy. That's the question in life. But it's much more complex for us. We want to know how things work. We want to understand cause and effect. We look for explanations of things. We study things further and deeper by using telescopes and microscopes and sonar and radar. We try to make our world a better place by solving the practical difficulties of life on earth. We invent things. We make things, complex things, not just nests and holes in the ground, but the internet and telecommunications and medicines and supersonic flight. We look for purpose. We ask questions about good and evil. We ask questions about, well, how did life actually first come about? And is there life after death? And we ask whether there is meaning to human existence other than what you might make up for yourself. What is humankind that you're mindful of us? the human beings that you care for us. You see, the psalmist uh, in verse 5 recognises that we are unique, that we have a very special place in creation, and that we're actually rulers over creation. See there in verse 5, Oh, you've made them a little lower than the angels. Crown them with glory and honour. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that's in the paths of the sea. It's certainly evident, isn't it, that human beings have a unique place in this created world. No other living being has so dominated and cultivated its landscape as humankind has. Now, you might not be thinking that if you came face to face or hand to paw with a lion in the savannah, right? You might be thinking, I am about to be completely dominated. Or if you came face to face with a great white in the ocean with all of its shiny teeth, you'd be thinking, I'm not going to rule over this being at this particular moment in time. But the bigger picture is that lions and great whites are endangered. Humans are not. It's obvious that we're rulers over creation. Now, anthropologists will suggest many of the reasons for this, like the size of our brain or the opposing thumb that we have on our hand. And I'll tell you, it's really helpful. My dogs can't pick up many things, uh, not with their hands anyway. Uh, our self-control and our ability to temper our natural desires. Interestingly, we've always understood that as something that defines us as human beings, that we can control our natural desires. We're going strange places nowadays where we're starting to define ourselves by our natural desires, but that's another story. Uh, maybe it's our cooperation within community. Maybe it's our ability to retain and pass on knowledge. All these things anthropologists might study about humankind, but all these things are God-given. And so the question remains, why? Why has God cared for us in such a way? Why us? Of all the life forms that we know in the universe, and they seem to be completely and totally concentrated on this particular planet, in this particular galaxy, the solar system in this particular galaxy, why us? The Bible says, because we've been made in the image of God. We've been made for relationship with Him. And we had that catechism question number five this week. Last week, we might remember if you were here last week, catechism number four. How and why did God create us? God created us male and female in his own image to know him, to love him, to live with him and glorify him. That is God's purpose for us, that we might have relationship with him. We've been made in his image that we might know him. And so I must ask you today, do you know him? Because it's entirely possible to have an incredible brain, unlike any other living being, and to use that brain to get on in the midst of human society on planet Earth, and yet it's entirely possible not to use that brain to know God. And it's entirely possible to admire creation through telescope or microscope or the naked eye, uh, to enjoy its beauty, but not to enjoy the creator who made it. 
And it's entirely possible to work the environment for fruitfulness. You might be a farmer who works it actually with your hands or a courier driver or you might um, be an accountant who uses your brain to organise finances, whatever your labour. Have you thanked the God who gave you your gifts and your capabilities so that you might be productive and fruitful and provide? You know, it's such human perversity that we would be created for this, to know him and to love him, to be in relationship with him, and yet we would turn away from him and ignore him and not be in relationship with him. The Bible calls that turning away sin. That is that we reject him, the one who has made us to know him, and we've come to make a, a, an idol out of all the things that have been created. And the Bible says it's inexcusable, inexcusable, but not unforgivable. And again, we must praise him. Oh Lord, how majestic is your name. He is not only the creator who made us, the ruler that we should submit to, the judge that we're accountable to, but he's also the loving and heavenly father who can forgive us. He sends his son into the world. The son of God takes on human flesh and Jesus lived the perfect life. And then he died a saving death and he was raised from the dead to give victory over the grave. And soon after Jesus lived and died and had been raised again, there was another author penning some more of the Scriptures under the inspiration of the Spirit. And he was actually reflecting on Psalm 8 that was written some thousand years before him. And he was writing to Hebrew Christians in Rome at the time of the first century. And his word of encouragement has actually been preserved for us in the book of the Bible called Hebrews. And life wasn't going particularly smoothly for these Hebrew Christians. They weren't exactly living the Psalm 8 experience. They were undergoing persecution and hardship, famine and sword. They were not ruling over all things. And no doubt, your life feels like that at times as well. I'm sure there are plenty of times when you don't feel like life is under control, when you're not ruling things well, uh, when you're not managing your life, maybe your relationships, your work or your study or your home base, your resources, your time, your money, your health. Well, Hebrews chapter 12, the author reflects on Psalm 8 and says, you know what? At present, we do not see everything subject to humankind, but we do see Jesus, who was made little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honour because he suffered death so by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. You see, friends, Jesus has fulfilled the Psalm 8 picture of humanity. He is the exemplary human. He obeyed his heavenly Father. He loved his neighbour as himself. And on many occasions, he displayed his complete and utter authority over the created world. Now, I'm not sure when you last read a gospel... Um, you can consider the Gospels a selected history of the three years of Jesus' very public life. But if you haven't read a Gospel in the last five years, then I suggest that you do it. Um, pick up a Gospel, just search it on your phone, Matthew, Mark, Luke or John, um, on your phone in a web browser and it comes up. But even better, read it with another Christian. And as you read it, you've got to ask a question. The Psalm 8 question as we look out upon the created world, is what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? But the gospel question, as we look out upon the gospels and read about the life of Jesus, is who is this man? Who is this man who heals the sick and calms the storms and casts out demons and raises the dead? Who is this man who touches the untouchable, who loves the unlovable, who admonishes the greedy and the proud and rebukes the self-righteous? Who is this man who willingly goes to the cross and dies the death that he didn't deserve to die? Not because he had to pay for his own sins, but because he chose to pay for our sins that we might be forgiven. Who is this man who fulfills Psalm 8 when we couldn't? And then invites us to put our trust in him as a saviour. Who is this man? He's Jesus, the Son of God. He's the radiance of God's glory. He's the exact representation of his being. And he invites us into relationship with him. He invites us to follow him. 
So friends, can I say, if you have been invited to church this morning by someone and your curiosity is triggered, maybe you're thinking, wow, this is entirely possible that God has created humanity to know him, to love him, to honour him. And maybe you think that knowing Jesus is actually the way to come to know God and to enjoy a relationship with God. Then that's what we specialise in here, actually, here at Warnable Presbyterian Church. We are just a bunch of ordinary people from all ages and stages of life who have come to see that the reason for our existence is to know God, to love God and to honour God. We're disciples of Jesus, so we study his word and we seek to put it into practice and we'd love you to join us on this journey. It's not something that you do on your own. So I'm really hopeful that this is just the start of a conversation with you, a bit like we heard from Jordan a bit earlier. He had someone start a conversation with him. Uh, and you can continue this conversation with those that invited you along or introduce yourselves to us after the service and maybe have a bit of morning tea together. Um, but for now, allow me to lead you in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we are just in awe of you, the creator of all that we can see, hear and touch and smell and taste, this physical world. We thank you that you have created us, humanity, with a unique place in this creation, that we've been made in your image, unlike any other living being, to know you, to love you, to be in relationship with you. And we thank you that even though we fall way short of this task, both of managing our world and of knowing and loving you, we thank you that you've sent Jesus into the world and that he has done that for us. We thank you that he, when he went to the cross, he wasn't paying for his own sins, that he was paying for ours, so that all who turn back to you and uh, put their trust in him can know the gift of forgiven sins and the joy of eternal life that begins even here and now in new life with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.